any rate, uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for you guys taking time out of your day to spend with us. We are um, excited and, and it's a pleasure for us to be here. We'd like to be with you in person. I know that this is a different time for us, so virtual we'll have to do. Um, I'll start off by just introducing myself. My name is Kenneth and um, Kenneth Johnston. I am the principal owner of KJ2 Productions and um, excited to be here. Um, I'll let Kevin introduce himself and then also Eric. Yep, I'll go next. Um, I'm Kevin Mullahan. I'm the production manager here at KJ2 Productions, um, which pretty much means I um, am there with the initial client when we first meet them and start talking to them all the way through production. And I will hopefully make you happy all along the way and all the way until you get the videos that you have been promised. He's basically the man. <laughs> oh, thank you. All right. Uh, I'm Eric Whitehead. I am the lead video editor at KJ2 Productions. I basically do everything from uh, grabbing the media cards, ingesting them into the system and starting up Premiere Pro projects, editing stuff, doing motion graphics, um, managing an assistant editor, uh, and um, just trying to streamline our workflows and make sure that uh, everything is flowing smoothly and delivering really awesome videos. So we are what you call a full service production company. Uh, we started almost, we just celebrated actually our 10 year anniversary. So um, we survived the game. We survived COVID. Uh, we're still plugging through, but um, the beauty of what we do is that we actually are in the position of doing what we absolutely love. Um, and that's very fortunate for us. Um, most of us have went to uh, there's nine of us on board. Uh, we range from individuals like myself that are more like producing to Kevin, who does like production management and is also a producer. We also have um, cinematographers, a couple of guys that do focus primarily on production work. Um, and then we have a couple of editors that work. So we're kind of full service. We can basically take a project from uh, concept to uh, fruition and bring it all the way through um, from a business model. The idea of, of what we do is we work as a team, a cohesive team uh, where everyone kind of focuses on certain avenues of the business, which makes us much more efficient. We work a lot with nonprofits in this region and outside of the region. We do a lot of work that's uh, focused on event-based uh, projects and then commercial-based projects. And then the last kind of node that we work with is kind of in the sports arena. So we do a lot of sports documentary work or sports, um, uh, a lot of work in the space of uh, sports for social media. So that is kind of our primary focus of business. Um, I'll let Kevin and then Eric talk a little bit more about, you know, the, that side of it. So go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, we also work with a ton of banks right now, which is pretty amazing. But um yeah, we pretty much take on, you know, we have a variety of projects that we have to constantly be ready to adjust to and not, not no two projects are ever the same for us. Um, just in the last couple of weeks, we've done like uh, a couple different high end banks. We've done some nonprofits and we're doing kind of documentary style projects too for nature reserves and, and such. So we have to be pretty nimble and be flexible and be creative with everything that we do. We really have to uh, pay attention to what the client wants and then uh, be ready to perform, which is always, you know, challenging and difficult, but exciting at the same time. The creative world is, is one of these things where you kind of have to have, you know, some business. If you want to do this as a business, Gonna have to have some business acumen, um, and then also you got to stay creative. Working with a team, the great thing about working with a team is that you don't have to do it all on your own. And I know some of you guys are out there probably creating your own videos, creating your own concepts, um, editing your own videos, which is great. Um, in the world of, you know, when you start getting into the professional world, you know, it's nice to have individuals that are on your team that can help you. Um, 
and typically that are good at certain aspects of what they do. Uh, you know, when I went to film school, I kind of learned the whole gamut of, of filmmaking, but I also gravitated towards some of the things that I like to do. So, you know, for me, I, I enjoy big vision. I enjoy producing the idea of the concept. I'm not necessarily, um, I'm not necessarily big on the idea of, of lighting, for instance. So then what do I do is I figure out how do we partner with someone that can, that can do that aspect of the business better. So then that's how we started to gravitate to the idea of building a team. So now we have people that on our team that like the set, people that focus on audio, people that like, like Eric that focus on the editorial side of the business, people like myself and Kevin that focus on more so on the idea of, of, of getting the business, but then also project managing the business, if that makes sense. So you know, that's kind of like our whole process of, of really bringing this into an environment where we can service. The, our biggest goal is going out, getting a client, but making sure that we can service the client all the way through. We commit to a date of delivering the product. We commit to a date of our, we commit to uh, the concept of a project. And then we'll, through this meeting, we're going to take you through how we basically, the entire process of, of attaining a, a client and servicing the client all the way through. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, Kevin, what is, so we want to go into start talking about putting a value on our work and producing during COVID. <laughs> producing, <laughs> producing during COVID. So just to give you guys a little bit of concept, COVID, the whole process of COVID really destroyed us initially back in February uh, or, or March, excuse me. March, we started, because what we do, a lot of the stuff that we do, number one is event-based um, live events, recording live events. So all live events were gone. The second portal of business that we do is about 30% of the business that we do is outside of this region. So all travel was banned. So that completely rocked us. And then the sports arena, things that we did in sports was gone because all sports shut down. And then the last kind of portal of business was companies that have extra money or extra opportunities that they want to do creative stuff. So everybody at that point was really tight. So all of that shut down. So literally we lost about 95% of our business when COVID hit. So we were pretty much shut down. Uh, so we had to figure out as a company, what could we do? And, and what Kevin was saying earlier is about being nimble. What could we do that was in, in our wheelhouse, but not necessarily was our bread and butter? So we had to figure out things fairly quickly in order for us to survive. Uh, and one of the things, one of the avenues that we went down uh, was kind of shifting towards the virtual space. So we invested money in buying equipment that kind of related to doing virtual events, things that we can, and not necessarily Zoom, like this is a Zoom, you know, we're all using web cam computers to kind of communicate. We wanted to add value to some of the customers that we had. So we wanted to be able to produce live events, multi-camera live events that we can go out and basically add production value. So a lot of people that were doing, still doing events, they couldn't do them with people in the building. So we started producing events where we would go and rent a space and still do a live event to give that effect of it where we would have a multi-camera production, but be able to stream it live via Facebook Live, YouTube Live, um, Vimeo Live, those types of platforms. So that was one of the things that we shifted pretty early. Um, and that's one of the things that actually carried us through the, the initial side of COVID. And then we also had to figure out what services can we provide to clients? So we started thinking about crisis management. We're gonna show you a video here that we produced pretty quickly, Kevin, right? I think it was uh, the Friday, March 23rd, when they announced it, when the NBA announced that they were closing, shutting down, then that kind of set the trend for everyone else. And two days later, I think it was on that Friday, the governor's office called us, uh, the governor's office here in California, called us to help and see if we can help produce this series of PSAs that we're gonna give information on COVID and how to dispel or just give you know helpful information on COVID. So that was kind of 
us initially. So we thought maybe crisis communication. That wasn't something that we did before, but we thought, okay, that's something that we can produce. Um, so how do we go out there and look at companies or corporations or organizations? Uh, we're going to show you another sample of a video that, we're work, that we work on constantly now where churches, um, we help, we started helping out a lot of churches doing virtual events because churches couldn't gather. Uh, people couldn't come to church and that's one area during crisis is a lot of people seek refuge in sports and they seek refuge in going to church uh, and churches couldn't gather. So we figured how do we get opportunity to still, sorry, bro is taking care of making sure no one's breaking in. Um, but yeah, so we, we thought about how do we help out? So we started assisting churches with their services and streaming live services, but streaming them with multi cameras, multi um, multi cameras, and creating that, still creating that experience for people, but in a virtual way. Yeah. Do you want to show the uh, Dr. Angel COVID spot now, or would you like to show the business as unusual? You think? Yeah. Let's show the business. This is so. This is us shifting pretty quickly. The, the, the concept of this business as unusual was something that I coined pretty early on because we had to learn to do business as unusual um, initially. And we wanted to, we know we, we knew we had to shift our concept of how we do business. So what we thought was we activated our team and we said, we're going to go around and talk to other people in the community, other businesses, organizations, churches, and say, let's go out there and let's go out and capture these stories. So we created this docu-series called Business as Unusual. And uh, it's basically it's based off of what we had to do as a business in shifting our methodology of how we're gonna do business. So go ahead and play that. This is, the, this is kind of the promo for it. Scene one, take one, and mark. All right, good deal. Is this on? All right, let's get after it. We're seeing new evidence that the coronavirus pandemic may be on the rise. Jake Mossware, President and CEO of St. Hope. My name is David Garibaldi. I'm Daryl Steinberg, the Mayor of Sacramento. We are doing business as unusual. So that was a project that we're still, that was, uh, we, we put that promo out a few months ago, but it's a project that we are still working on um, as a company. And uh, actually it's got optioned, it got picked up by uh, CBS. So it's going to start airing sometime before the end of the year as a docu-series. But the focus of that project is really just us talking to other businesses and organizations on how they had to shift during COVID and what they're doing to kind of maintain business or operate business in a different way. Hence the name business as unusual. Um, let's, let's, Kevin, now maybe let's show, this was one of the original, uh, let's show the PSA for um, Dr. Agnable. She's uh, the director of the California Department of Health. This was a call that we got from the governor's office that they wanted us to help produce these PSAs that kind of focused on, on COVID and what to do kind of in the COVID response. So Kevin will show you a sample of what we, a 30 second PSA that was for broadcast. And I just wanted to quickly add that I left the little bumper on here just because I think it's kind of cool to show uh, for, per, for broadcast. You have to have little information in this beforehand. Um, give me one second. This is called a slate. 
We can all help protect each other from COVID-19. People who are older and those who have underlying medical conditions can be at increased risk for severe illness. If you're frequently around or are a member of one of these high-risk groups, wash your hands often and disinfect your home. Make sure you have an adequate supply of regular medications and avoid large crowds. If you do have symptoms like cough and fever, call your doctor or local health department before seeking treatment. For more information on how to stay healthy, visit covid19.ca.gov. So that, how long, that is, how, go ahead. You guys, how long did those uh, videos take to produce? I mean, like editing and uh, shooting <laughs> as well. So, so that's not a, we, I always use this phrase that we're not news. Um, and no offense to anyone that's out there, Christy, that's in the news business. Um, when I say we're not news, meaning that we typically, um, we typically like to take our time with projects. When I say take our time, uh, we like to go through a process of pre-production to make sure that we have the right materials, the right, the script, the storyboard, so on and so forth. That's in, in a normal world. Um, and then we shoot it. It may be a one day shoot, a two day shoot, whatever that takes. And then we commit to a client of from an editorial standpoint, we, we, our process is typically we'll give them a rough cut, then a client will kind of, kind of give us some feedback. And then we go through a process of, of getting that feedback and making some revisions and so on and so forth. In a normal environment, our turnaround time is usually around two weeks on a project. I think we have one question here that came from Maria and she asked, do you guys make your videos separately or work on one project together? What's up Maria? Um, no, everything that we do is, is in the, the fashion of a team. So there's not really any projects that, um, any one of us work, works on individually. I mean, we may take the lead on a project, but having a team is, you know, that's the benefit of having a team is that, you know, I may take the lead on the initial side of the project, then have Kevin help me with the, you know, scaling the project out whether it's storyboarding it out, whether it's budgeting the project, whether it's, you know, getting a timeline on the project, then that, then we toss it over to Cody, which is our, Cody is not on the, on today, but Cody is our, our production lead. So he's our cinematographer and he'll kind of figure out like the crew that he needs with it. So we'll, you know, Kevin helps scheduling our crew on the project, depending on what the type of equipment we need, depending on what type of, uh, uh, you know, how many days we need to shoot it. Um, and then we'll get a production schedule together, uh, a call sheet, a cast list, um, a script, a storyboard, whatever that, whatever that project needs. And then we go out and shoot that. And then we then have a system where we come back, we turn the, the content in, whether it's we shoot on whatever media cards we shoot on, then we kind of toss that over to Eric. And then Eric kind of leads the, the post-production team. So we have a few different editors that Eric will oversee and Eric will disseminate information depends on what Eric takes on as a responsibility or depending on what his workload is or our delivery dates on other projects. You know, you gotta look at this from a professional standpoint. I will, I will preface this by saying everything that I talk about is gonna come from a creative side and a professional side. And I think that's important when you're thinking about, you know, I stress the kids all the time, you know, this is your creative passion. If you want to monetize your creative passion, you have to do it in a way that you you don't allow anyone to marginalize your creativity. So if you put a price point on what you feel like you deserve, then put that price point and feel comfortable in doing it. That was the hardest thing for me when I got out of school because I have a business degree initially and then I went back and got a film degree. But trying to mesh that mesh to initially was very tough for me. Because I always felt like what I did, I loved and I was passionate about it, but I didn't know how to put a price point on it. So you have to figure out a methodology, as Kevin was saying, you know, to, to because if someone's coming to you, they're coming to you for a reason. So they're coming to you for your creative passion, your creative instinct, your creative knowledge. Um, if not, they would do it themselves. So what you have to offer them is that level of professional service or that level of professionalism that they feel, wow, this is why I came or I hired someone to do it. So trying to guide your clients through and helping them through, sometimes they know what 
they have an idea of what they want. They may have saw something on TV that may, you know, one of the other things it always is doing is, hey, you have an idea. Have you seen something out there? Send me a link, you know, of a video that you like. And then let's dissect that video. Now, and a lot of times, the thing that the, the white elephant in the room is the budget. So they may see something that's really cool or that has really cool graphics or really cool effects, but they have a, a $10 budget. Now you have to figure out, like, how do I take this really great idea and still make it really good, but to fit within their budget? So that also is a conversation that you have to have at some point with clients. I understand and that's one of those things that maybe you talk to, not necessarily in the first kind of uh, ideation meeting, but maybe that second meeting, like you have a budget in mind. And then that's how we now figure out how do we put a proposal together that will match what their idea is, but also match, match their pocket. I'll just say, yeah, adding on to that, um, everyone's going to undervalue your services. Everyone yeah. thinks video is easy until they get out and they try and do it themselves. And then they find out it's not easy. There's a lot of work that goes into it. A lot of pre-production. People underestimate how much thought has to go into every little thing that you do. And a lot of mistakes are going to happen along the way. But everyone's going to try and say, can you do it for free? Can you do it for cheap? Um, they're going to try and short you on time and time is money too. They're going to say, you can do this in like an hour. No problem. Right. We're just going to go out and film somebody for two minutes and then it's all over. No two minute videos take hours to produce and so much work and people will undervalue you. I promise you that you're going to have to do some free work early. You're going to have to prove yourself. You're going to have to learn on the, on the, the, the way, but then I would um, say, um, I would say, you know, to add to Kevin, Everyone with one of these right now is your competition. Because everyone thinks that they can shoot video. They think they can produce video. But Kevin, maybe we could share a couple of background skills of, of just an idea of, because what Kevin is talking about as far as from a production value is what, you know, you guys look at Nick right now in this cool van um, with all that equipment behind him. Stuff is not cheap. So you have to figure out, you know, what you bring to the table and then, and what's what's that added value? Um, and not only just your physical time, but also your mental time that you put onto a project. But Kevin, maybe pull up a couple of background skills just to kind of talk about our show equipment or what we do behind. Because people, what they see a thirty second video, and you guys are talking about thirty second PSAs, which seems like it's an easy thing to do. But we just talked about that PSA that we showed you a couple of minutes ago. That thing took hours to set up, lighting when it comes to it, so on and so forth. So these are just kind of some sample shots of some productions that this is an outdoor production, but most people think, oh, I can go shoot outside and use natural light. Well, natural light sometimes causes a lot of overexposed shots. It causes a lot of, you know, uh, underexposed shots depending on the shadows. Um, but this is just kind of like a sample interview that we did, but the amount of equipment it takes just to set that up. This is an indoor interview um, showing how much equipment is behind the scenes, but the lighting that it takes to go into the place, the audio, you know, we don't see what goes on behind the scenes. And this is kind of gives you an idea of what that looks like. And we and had a couple, oh, a couple students, sorry. Uh, we had a couple students ask, what kind of equipment uh, do you guys use to film and edit? And since you're showing some slides, could you kind of maybe run through a couple of uh, equipment that you guys are using? Yeah, primarily, uh, Camera equipment, we are Canon folks. So we use a Canon cinema lines. We use Canon C100s, Canon C200s. We also have some Canon DSLRs. Um, uh, this is like a shot where we use like a teleprompter, for instance. Um, but yeah, mostly Canon. Canon lenses, we also um, use a lot of prime lenses. Uh, Audio-wise, we have a lot of, a lot of uh, other equipment that we use like this gimbal here, we use gimbals, Ronin's. Uh, we use a lot of, we use drones. We have a couple of drones in our fleet. We have, um, uh, let's see, sliders. We'll use sliders. We use, you know, a lot of things that, that allows us to get really creative and detailed shots. So equipment is very important. Uh, lights, uh, yeah, we have a variety of lights of different kinds. Everyone's going LED now. Highly suggest that. They're not hot lights anymore. We used to burn ourselves all the times on hot lights. We don't have to do that anymore. Uh, and 
the, the LEDs are getting better by the day and more affordable, more portable. They're lighter. We could travel with these, I think, is one of the things that, you know, we we did a, a, a project for uh, this company called Search Institute, which uh, we had to travel across the US. And so we had to bring all our gear with us in like three bags, <laughs> three large bags, you know, three large bags. But uh, so being able to be mobile like that with uh, LEDs and such and was just uh, so helpful. And, and everything's getting easier. Everyone with the phones, like he said, with video on it, it's, it's getting better, more affordable. Competition's getting tougher, tougher, but it's it's good. But you are the differentiator, so don't 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 ever forget that. What you bring to the table, like Kevin said, don't let anyone marginalize what you do, um, because you are the differentiator in all of it. So everyone can have the same equipment, but if you don't have the same process, you know that I I I, I look at that as you know you can I I use this example as of a triangle. Triangle has three points. You can be, you can, one is cost, one is experience, and one is quality. No one can offer all three. You can't be the cheapest person. You can't give the best product, and you can't give the best experience. So think about which ones you want to focus on, and make sure you always offer that. To people. We try to offer the best quality and the best experience. We're not the cheapest. Can you guys explain a little bit? I know, uh, let's see, I think it's Haley from Pleasant Grove High School asks, uh, where did some of you guys on your team go to film school? Good question. So I went to Chapman down in Southern California. Uh, we have Kevin, we have about three or four people that went to the Art Institute here in Sacramento. We have two that went to um, Loyola Marymount. Uh, down in Southern Cal, I Eric, went to, went to, I went to UCLA. Eric went to UCLA. Um, so we have a variety. Nice, it, Eric. <laughs> I did not know that, Kevin. <laughs> Apparently, I didn't know that. <laughs> but def definitely a different variety. And it's very expensive. Yes. So, not Kevin, uh, I mean, uh, Eric, do you want to talk a little bit about? Do we kind of want to talk about post production a little bit or what, what do we want to do? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I'm just looking at some of these questions here, uh, questions about um, software and hardware. Uh, the editing machine at the office um, is a, a gaming PC, essentially. It's got like a 10, 10 terabyte uh, SSD. Um, and there's a lot of footage. Uh, although, we have, although we have probably over, we have a server that has about 16 terabytes, and then we have a lot of cold storage. So we have a lot of storage. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not sure the exact amount, but it's probably upwards of, I don't know, 30 to 50 terabytes of, of information that we have stored on those things. Um, so that's, that's what we use. I use an iMac at home. Um, and the reason we're able to do that is because uh, like a lot of um, like a lot of production houses, we use Premiere Pro and the Adobe Creative Suite uh, to edit on, and so projects are portable between uh, Windows machines and Mac machines. Um, so that's that's primarily what we use. Uh, and there's a lot. Obviously, we're editing mostly in Premiere, but there's a lot of um, After Effects work, and I also use um, Illustrator and Photoshop a lot. Uh, because we're getting assets from clients and usually we like to get them in illustrator format uh, or um, you know some sort of SVG or something like that uh, vector graphics so that when we're scaling things things that doesn't become pixelated and uh, we can pull different parts of logos out and animate those um, at the same time so uh, so that's that's primarily what we use in terms of um, hardware and software you want to show them maybe like a timeline of maybe yeah. like um, all right let's see if this this works here sharing screen is always especially all right and we'll just go to premiere here so this is a project for golden one credit union um you can see it's a pretty stacked project it looks like there's eight video tracks 
Um, generally, the way uh, the way that I edit is that you ingest the footage in, uh, make sure you have a good file structure here. For this one, there were actually four days of shoots. So um, I have all of these A cam, B cam. Uh, for this one, I separated them out. There was a series of videos. Uh, there's actually a series of six videos. Started out seven, but um, they merged one of the videos, so there's six videos. So there's an employee appreciation. We have what's called hero shots, which is basically um, like these shots here. If it'll play there. Uh -oh. So that's called a hero shot. Um, it's basically like you know somebody smiling or giving some sort of gesture. See how the guy up here, he's giving a gesture there. Um, and then this over here, this was for another video. And then this is the service week video. So um, this is a pretty extensive shoot. Like I said, four days. Um, one of the things that's really important to me is organizing footage <laughs> and organizing, having a good file structure in both the actual, um, on the hard drives, but also inside of Premiere itself. So uh, that's how I have it here. Um, there's no audio in this. We didn't shoot external audio. Uh, we use lapel mics, as you can see here, but it was all in camera. Uh, I also imported some other videos that we had done for Golden One before and used some of that as, um, as some footage here. This is a different one of the other videos, but that's some of the, this here is, a, is from a, a different video that was delivered a few weeks ago, actually. Um, so there's that. Uh, Let's see, going back to here, um, I've got another bucket or a bin that I use called graphics. This is a lot of standard stuff that we use at KJ, but also um, there's a, things like this golden one logo, which is important. Um, and then also things just like white mats and stuff like that. Uh, lots of stuff that you know I use to, to create um, different things. I'll also put some sort of end cards and stuff sometimes I'll just create graphics directly in Premiere. And so here, um, if I talk of these tracks, this is just the background from a, um, from a Photoshop file that they sent us. And then I composited in the different other elements that they had and created a card here. I'm gonna go to After Effects, which is right here. So um, some of the stuff I would create in After Effects too. Um, this is the opening slide here. What I did was I basically took this logo that they sent us and I split it. Um, there are two instances here. If I toggle the mat open, you can see there's a mask on that. So I essentially like removed the two separate parts of this so that I can animate it in, in some way that's you know, more interesting in the creative than just uh, slapping it up on screen. Um, and then one of the other things I did uh, is I created a custom transition to for this. I basically traced the one in their logo and, um, and I created a transition that allowed me to throw it over the top of the video and uh, have it transition between two takes, um, not two, two takes, two clips. Uh, and then if you want to see the, the nuts and bolts of how I did it, it's right here. It's basically three shape layers that I made there. So there's a white one, a black one, and then a yellow one. Hey, Eric, real quick, can you just explain to people what After Effects is? Because I think there might be some yes. people in our audience that have no idea what After Effects is. So just of course. So After Effects is a, um, essentially what's called a compositing, uh, it's called compositing software. Uh, compositing is where you take, one, you take more than one element and you layer it on top of uh, something else and um, you create sort of a new composition. That's what these things are called. It says comp one up here. That's composition. Um, this is actually a, a random countdown timer <laughs> that I was creating. Um, but all these things are called compositions. And that's, and that's because the main goal of After Effects is to, is to take a bunch of different things and put them all on in one place uh, so that you can move them around and create, um, 
and, and create a motion graphics uh, uh, product. It's Photoshop for video, right? Yes, Photoshop for video, yeah. Um, and they're, one of the main things is uh, called keyframes. Um, and that's what these are down here. These are called keyframes. And it's essentially telling, uh, it's essentially giving, um, it's how you move stuff around. <laughs> mm -hmm. You tell it, you start here and you go to here. Uh, so start at this position and scale, and then you go to this position and scale, and that's what creates that effect. It sort of interpolates what needs to happen in between. So, um, yeah, that's the main that's the main tool of uh, of After Effects is called keyframes. From a, from an editor's perspective, can you kind of walk us through? Um, like, do you have the storyboards from the show? You know, from the plan? Do you? What are, what assets are you using to help create your final edit uh, for a PSA? There's usually some sort of direction from the client. Um, we're trying to implement a um, a unified creative brief, uh, and that is basically like tells you uh, about the client. It tells you what the project is, how long it is. Um, if there's a script, other things that they need. Um, sometimes, if that's not available, we'll go off of some sort of questionnaire. Kevin has a questionnaire that he gives out to clients. Uh, so we'll go off of that. Um, other times we just have a meeting and you write stuff down and sometimes it's run and gun. So you don't have time to have that all filled out and, you know, have it all neat, all neat and pretty. So you just gotta have a meeting, uh, get it all dispelled to you orally, write it down and then go from there. Traditionally you send out what's called a call sheet, which tells everybody where to show up um what time to show up uh, who's going to be there what you're filming and um even what the weather is in the closest hospital you know they give you all that kind of information i took and created something my own i call a dpr it's a daily production report and what this does this is uh, something i stole from uh when i worked on property brothers show they had what they call a daily production report which kind of carries through all three um carries th through all three phases of production in that it'll tell us where we're going so this project was for golden one it was for their business development um so it talks it says sorry what the story is being told just briefly to tell the crew this is all for the crew pretty much to show up what kind of gear they should bring uh the audio the technical specs that they're going to be shooting in um we got to communicate all that um because well back to the gear you don't ever want to forget any piece of gear <laughs> back at the office um you don't want to be left with where's that little cord that connects this thing to this thing you know so organization of gear is always important um and then make sure all your cameras are shooting in the same specs and then this kind of just shows us where we got to be at what time you can see on this one, we shot at Golden One, and then we had a, a second location, I think, for that one. Um, and then who's on the crew, and then a general overview of the plan. I attached the storyboards. I'll, I'll go to that in just a second. This was just uh, show the exterior of what they're when they're coming up, what they're going to be seeing, just to let them know. Um, and if we didn't like the exterior of this building is what this, if we didn't like the exterior of this golden one, which is where we were filming, we could, I gave them another location to where to go film this one for an exterior. And then I put material sent. This is kind of for the, for the post production. Um, so in the material sent to office, we're going to talk about any sort of SD cards, um, audio cards, drone footage, anything that you hear you write, how many cards you put any information of if a card got corrupted or anything, you put it there so that the editor knows how much footage there should be. Um, and then the notes, that's to tell them, this is again communication, like what problems we ran into. Cause sometimes an editor's looking at something and he's like, why did they do that? Why would they, did they make this decision? Um, why didn't they get this? So again, communicating everything that potentially went wrong and why we the decisions we made on set. And then down here, I put a little thing for notes. Um, like if we, if the uh, 
DP, the director of photography thought of a cool shot or um, added something or filmed it a certain way or a certain style or anything like that, that he wants to communicate to the editor, he can put that there. Um, and just, then, to, uh, just to show you sometimes the notes and everything can be rather extensive. Uh, so that's an example of one. And then this an example. Oh, can we see? Yeah. This is an example of some of the notes. <laughs> Another page of notes. So it can get pretty extensive. Um, thankfully, there were a lot of notes taken. So. Um, must be Logan. Yeah, <laughs> I think it was Andrew actually. It looks like Andrew's writing because the ones look like twos. <laughs> you want to show them the storyboard, Kevin? Yeah, I'll show a real quick. Uh, Hey, hey Kevin, real quick, um, do you guys have uh, like a, a copy of that DPR form that you'd be willing to share with our teachers yeah. that the kids could use um, to? Yeah. Yeah, certainly. Okay, thank you. This is a, um, this is just kind of a, a, uh, the Golden One commercial. This was for a 30, it's actually a 45 second commercial that we did here. Um, so I cannot draw. And so I use a editing program. I believe it's called Previs Pro. It's something you can download on your laptop. They have different versions. They have free versions. They have a paid version. I use the $20 version here. And um, so they'll give you these characters. Um, can you zoom in by chance? Uh, yeah, let me see here. Here's easy. Oh, awesome, thank you. So you'll see that these figures I did not draw these figures or any sort of uh, animation. I took a combination of like for the background and the golden one here. Can you, can you see my cursor by the way? Okay. Yeah, we can see. Like this, I took a screenshot off the internet and then placed this person in front to show that they walk by the sign. Um, you'll also see on here the suggested, I always say suggested because the director of photography will take his own ideas of what's best but uh like uh length of lens uh positioning uh the the framing all these different things and for the most part the, the communication is good they and they like it they'll do it <laughs> but here yeah you could see um this was my version of a mask that i could find close enough <laughs> uh you have to be imaginative when it comes to these types of things so, so, show, sorry, do you want to show the finished video? Yeah, so what I would say, you know, just to sum it up, basically a storyboard is is going to give a client a vision of what they're going to see before we ever shoot it. So it's not like we're going out and shooting a bunch of stuff. And Kevin, while we're doing this, why don't we pull up that video to kind of see how it translated over. So okay. those are the shots. I've got it right here. Okay. You got it? Okay. Yeah. Okay, those are the series of shots that the client can see before we even shoot it that they would give the okay on. So it gives them an idea of what it's going to look like before we actually produce it. And you then this the is the final product. All right, here we go. One shot. Yeah. 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 All right, so this is that finished video. Banking at home is easy and convenient. And it's the best way for all of us to protect ourselves and each other. If you'd like to visit one of our Golden One branches, we want you to know we're doing our part to care for your well being and each other. Because at Golden One, we know the only way this whole thing works is if we all cooperate and work together. As a not for profit cooperative serving members since 1933, we know a lot about looking out for each other. It's why we were founded. It's who we are. Golden One Credit Union. Stronger together. So I know it's probably hard to tell, but if you looked at the storyboard compared to what you saw in the video, it pretty much reflects almost shot to shot what ultimately was the final product. With, with, the, with the exception for a couple of added shots that we, we change up depending on what we saw on the scene. But for the most part, it gives almost like a template of what you're gonna see before it's even done, before it's even shot. So it helps the client understand 
you know, visually what they're going to see. Should we answer some more questions now? <laughs> sure. I uh, got a good question here from a lot of students. Uh, they're asking kind of, you guys do a lot of, most of your work for hire. Do you guys ever do creative projects that you come up with on your own to <laughs> like passion projects, things like that? Yeah, the, the business as unusual project that we showed a little bit before is certainly a passion project. No one's paying us for that. Um, we actually, ironically, good question you have, we have um, one, of our, uh, one of our team members, Blake, is in film school right now. Um, he's home because of COVID. So he's working on his student film project, which is a passion project this weekend. So our crew is helping him film that. So it's a three-day shoot. Starts on Friday, correct, Kevin? Yep, Friday, Friday Saturday, Saturday, Sunday, and they're all the whole team's pitching in to help him out with his film project. So yeah, so we do occasionally. You know, the the the, the great question that you have there is that typically we we all have these creative ideas. Uh, Kevin actually has a project that he's Kevin's a great writer. He has a project that he wants to work on. We've been so inundated with client projects that we kind of our passion projects kind of get shifted aside, but yeah, we all have, you know, business as usual was definitely a passion. It's definitely an ongoing passion project. It's a we call it a studio project. So it's our, we own, we own the rights to it. Um, but yeah, we, we certainly would love to do more. We actually do a lot of pro bono work as well um, for other organizations or we, we work a lot in the, um, in the environment of, of, of nonprofits that focus on, food disparity or education uh, achievement gap. So we do donate, you know, a lot of projects, uh, things that we're passionate about that we'll do for other organizations that are pro bono. Nice. Um, I think, let me see, in a couple of the questions here, uh, is there a project you remember that was really time consuming from, this is from Madison from Florence Markoffer kind of a project that was the most time consuming that you guys remember? Search, right? Oh, thank <laughs> it's, yeah, search, search Institute. Third, That's third. a loaded question, bro. Yeah. Who asked that question? <laughs> that was Madison from uh, Mark Hopper. Madison from Mark Hopper. Yeah, you'll have a lot of those. Um, I say the, the best answer for that is um, the, the, the more you invest in pre-production, the better your production comes out there's a there's a there's a law called murphy's law look that up that happens all the time in your project so we can it's always best to have a plan b or a or a contingency plan we had a project i, I think of the project that we just did cletus place was another <laughs> project that we shot there's a project that we shot for someone but covid pretty put pretty much put you know a, a wrench in the project and we had to stop post-production for a while and it, the project took a lot longer to complete than we anticipated. So that happens occasionally. But the one thing you want, always want to do is make sure you keep the client involved, keep the client informed, let them know, you know, where you stand with the project. So there's that, that, that level of professional is instilled. Yeah. Great yeah. question. Though. If you're if you're falling behind on a project, let them know as soon as possible. So they'll, they'll more likely be reasonable and understanding, but the goal is always to finish on time too. Nice. Um, Nick, can I throw so in go ahead. real quick? Yeah. Um, so you guys have the interns we heard. So um, do you guys do it just for college students or is it for high school, middle school? You, you know, where, where, what's the kind of, the, how's that work? So we've got some teachers asking about that as well. Yeah, we have a sort of two current interns we have. Um, one is at CRC. Um, and then one is at Sac City College. We've had high school interns in, in the past. Um, you know, my, my thoughts on interns is we actually pay our interns because I believe in the value of people's time. Um, and I also want people to realize that even if they're interning, that it's a responsibility. Whether you're volunteering for a project or not, you still have to maintain the fact that people are dependent on you. So and I also feel like I value people's time, so I want to make sure they feel valued. Um, but right now, we currently 
have college interns. We are actually just starting a project where the college interns are going to get actual credit, um, you know, time served credit at their school. So, you know, it's a project like with Sac State or with um, with uh, UC Davis where they actually get credits for, for interning with us. Um, but again, we've had high school interns in the past. One of the challenges with high school interns at sometimes is that we're on a, we work nights, we work weekends, we work, you know, so sometimes scheduling or, or access or, but we're more than open for something as long as that, you know, they have access to it. You know, sometimes kids, if they're in school during the day, they can only work in the evening. Sometimes we're leaving in the, so it's just, it's more of a scheduling thing. It's not as flexible, but we're open to it. We've done it before. All right, Dick, do you got one more question there? Let's slide in real quick. Uh, I believe I do. Let's see. Zoe asks, uh, do you guys have any mishaps during production? And if so, what's that like? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have, you know, Mur Murphy's Law is all, always plays into play, but having a contingency plan, having backup, you know, we've been on sets where we forgot equipment or we didn't, we had a situation a couple of weeks ago um, where I wasn't too happy about, we had a set of three sets of lavalier mics that were somehow missing. Um, so we got on a project and we didn't have the mics that I was looking for and our crew, um, it happened to be that we, we had worked the late night before the night before and people got tired and I get that, but we didn't put things back where they were supposed to go. So now the next day when we're looking for something, it's not in the same place. And now a crew goes out and they don't have the right equipment. So things like that can be circumvented by just managing your time, managing your equipment, treat it like it's your own. Um, and then keeping that level of professionalism. I got a quick story for that. That's not work related here. It was before I started working here. Um, I was doing a documentary on uh, this kind of, uh, I won't go into too much details of it, but we got this really great interview with um, the leader of this kind of religious sect uh, that was promoting the end of the world. So a lot of people were trying to get this interview and somehow I had a connection who was actually in the, in the belong to it. And as we are, we're filming on the way in, my cameraman is filming on the way in and he's looking at everything, looking at everything. We sit down for this big, long interview and I'm interviewing the guy for about 30 minutes and I had about 40 minutes slot with him. And in the last 10 minutes, I'm starting to run out of questions. I excitedly look to my cameraman and he looks down at his camera and then his jaw just drops. Uh, he had been recording on the way in and when he set it all up, he was nervous and excited. He pressed record, which actually stopped the video. And so we weren't recording the entire time of this, you know, interview. And I kind of looked to him and he, I just saw the dread in his face. So I quickly in the next couple of minutes started coming up with a rehash of every question I had asked. And that was painful. I felt really bad for him because he, he nearly cried about it. Wow. Well. All right, guys, we're, we're out of time. We just want to say thank you so much for uh, connecting with us and sharing your experiences and, and, uh, and skills here with us and our whole group. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.